Well, good morning, church. Let's all join together in praising this morning. Let's just welcome the Spirit into our homes. Father, we welcome you in here this morning. Great is your faithfulness, O God. You wrestle with the sinner's restless heart. You lead us by still waters and to mercy. And nothing can keep us apart. So remember your people. Remember your children. Remember your promise, O oh God. Your grace is enough. Your grace is enough. Your grace is enough for me. Great is your love and justice, God of Jacob. You use the weak to lead the strong. You lead us in the song of your salvation. And all your people sing along. So remember your people. Remember your children. Remember your promise, O oh God. Your grace is enough. Your grace is enough. Your grace is enough for me. Oh, your grace is enough. Your grace is enough. Your grace is enough for me. So remember. So remember your people, remember your children, remember your promise, O oh God. Your grace is enough, your grace is enough, your grace is enough for me. Yes, it's enough, God. Oh, your grace is enough. Heaven reaches out to us. Your grace is enough for me. Yes, God, I sing. God, I sing your grace is enough. Oh, I'm covered in your love. Your grace is enough for me. It's enough for me. God, we just come to you this morning and worship this morning. God, we just we welcome you into our homes. We just ask that you come in like the wind, Father. Fill up, fill up the spaces that are here. We are here for you. We want to see you. We want to know you more, God. And we ask it in your name. Amen.
Consider how you have invested the gifts of God in your life, in your family, in your home, in your neighborhood, in your church. We have an opportunity through our ministry of giving to be partners along with God and His creative and restorative work in the world. Thank you for your gifts and let us offer our praise to God in giving them. Never fails, never gives up, 
never runs out on me You are God, as we bow our heads this morning We put on love You tell us to do that, Father And we, we heed your words When we wake up in the morning We soak ourselves in love Before anything else And we just ask that you come to this place this morning, Father. May you fill up our hearts and our minds with, with you and, and your character and who you are and who you were and, and who you continue to be in and through your children, your kingdom, God. We just ask that today you not only be the God of our hearts, but you be the God of our lips. May we speak life and truth and love into others today and all days. And it's in your name we pray. Amen. Years ago, I saw a comic, a comic strip, and the first frame was a man attempting to rob another person on the street. He thrust his weapon into the man's face, held out a bag, and said, give me all your valuables. And in the next frame, the man who was being robbed was putting all of his friends in the bag. Outside of the gift of salvation, I can't think of a greater gift from God than friends. I was to meet with a friend. We made plans before Christmas, and we were going to meet in Nashville. We don't live in the same city anymore, so we were going to meet in Nashville and enjoy some good barbecue and good music, stay the night. But we had to postpone those plans, of course. We thought, March, that'll work. Well, we had to reschedule for April. Surely this thing will be over in April, right? Well, we rescheduled for May, and now I don't know when we're going to get to see each other. We can text, and we do text. We can talk on the phone, but it's just not the same being there. And there's nothing like being in the presence and in the company of friends, is there? The sage of Proverbs tells us in Proverbs 18, 24, one who has unreliable friends soon comes to ruin, but there is a friend who sticks closer than a brother. You might not know the first half of that verse. I'm sure you've heard the second half. Even if you didn't know it was scripture, there is a friend who sticks closer than a brother. But I like this translation best from the message Friends come and go, but a true friend sticks to you like family. With few exceptions, I believe people everywhere hunger for friends, friendships, true, deep, abiding, close friends. They are a gift for sure. And we were made to have friends Someone told me years ago that God created Eve because he was afraid that Adam would wander around the garden forever and never ask anybody for directions. But we know what the Bible says. We were made for companionship. It is not good for man to be alone, God said. We are better together. In 2 Timothy, the Apostle Paul, when he was in prison, wrote his young friend Timothy and said, "'Come to Rome before winter.'" And when you come, bring some warm clothes, bring some books. But most of all, he wrote, bring yourself. Again, I can honestly say, I don't know of anything more valuable, blessed, strengthening, encouraging than a true friend. And this is certainly a part of our identity as followers of Jesus we are friends with one another. We are friends with other believers. We are friends to our neighbors. And we're friends to the one in need. We hear that echoed by multiple prophets and certainly echoed by Jesus. I think of the parable of the Good Samaritan. We are to be open and available to all. So I want to ask you today, do you have friends? What are you doing to cultivate friendships. Let's go back to that verse in Proverbs, Proverbs 18, 24, the second half. A true friend 
sticks to you like family. For most of us, and sadly this isn't true for everyone, but for most of us, family, well, they're the ones who always accept you as you are. They never turn you away. Family, the ideal family is a, is a group of people who always encourage and strengthen you. It's a beautiful image to put family and friend together. A true friend sticks to you like family. We all know that there are some very important choices that every person makes in their life. What God you're going to follow, what God you're going to worship, who you're going to marry if you decide to marry, and who are going to be your friends. The God you, you choose to worship will change everything. And everybody worships, by the way, because everyone has a God, even the atheists, you see. Their God is unbelief. Everybody has a God, and every, everyone worships that God. So that's an important, crucial decision, of course. And if you choose to marry, that's an important decision because this is a person with whom you're going to share everything, life, build a life together. And of course, friends, the people with whom we surround ourselves, they shape our character, they influence who we are, what we are about. We need and desire friends. There is another proverb from chapter 12, verse 26, the righteous should choose their friends carefully for the way of the wicked will lead them astray. I think many of us learn from our parents the best way to find a good friend is to be a good friend ourselves. That, I would suggest, is the first part of Proverbs 18.24. Go back and read that. The reason why some people do not have good friends is because they are not a good friend to others. You don't take friends. You make them. Friends. Friends are the ones whose company that we enjoy. A friend turns a dreary day into something new entirely. A friend can bring the best out in you, point us in directions that maybe we hadn't thought of going a direction that we need to go. A friend's presence on the scene can change everything. Friends, they bring joy. They add a dimension of joy to our lives, not always by what they say or what they do, just by being there. I saw a meme a while back that said, I will text you 50 times in a row and feel no shame. You are my friend. You literally signed up for this. And there is something about that that rings true, isn't there? 25 years ago, I moved across the state, moved to a place where I literally knew no one. And my wife at the time, though we hadn't been married very long, decided this was not the kind of life that she wanted, an itinerant life of a United Methodist pastor. So she left, and I was crushed, of course. But every week, every weekend, Les or Steve or Mac, they would be there visiting with me. It was years later, years later, before I learned it was a coordinated effort. They had talked with each other. John needs us right now. Can you go this weekend? If you can go this weekend, I can go that weekend. And what about this weekend here? I heard someone say, a friend is someone who will walk into your house when the whole world has walked out. It's true. Friendship lasts through thick and thin. A friend is one who sticks closer than family. So again... We should all ask ourselves if we are making time in our lives to prioritize friendships and to cultivate new friendships. In Dante's Inferno, the nethermost depths of hell is that place where individuals are frozen in ice, unable to have companionship with any other person. Now, I know that's a work of fiction, but good friends are important for our physical health. Scientists 
Researchers, doctors have told us that. Friends are important for our psychological health. We've certainly learned that during this virus, haven't we? And friends are also significant to our spiritual well-being. One of the most powerful things Jesus says to his disciples is in John 14. I no longer call you servants, but I call you friends. And we certainly know his deep and profound love and friendship for us, don't we? It's in John's gospel where he also says, Greater love have no one than this, that a man lay down his life for his friends. And Jesus did that for us. One of the saddest stories in the Bible is the story of Amnon, who was the son of King David. He raped his own sister and was eventually murdered by his brother. How could that happen? Well, 2 Samuel 13 records the story, and you can go back and read it for yourself, but it's verse 3 that reveals the truth. But Amnon had a friend whose name was Jonadab. Now, Jonadab was a very crafty man. He had a dark heart and an evil mind. Well, because Amnon followed the advice of a so-called friend, he committed incest in the house of the king and brought shame to the entire family. All of this happened because he chose the wrong person to be his friend. Now, something like that isn't likely to happen to us, but it illustrates a greater truth. You run with the wrong crowd and you start listening to the wrong people. When you start listening to the wrong people, you start following the wrong message. When you hear the wrong message, the wrong advice, then you emulate that wrong example. And there are consequences. Some years ago in a previous congregation, there was a boy in the youth group and he started hanging around the wrong crowd. I'm certainly not seeking to cast judgment on any person, but I, but I think in the context of which I'm speaking, you understand what I'm communicating. And he started hanging around some boys that were not a good influence. Months and months, they shared time together. He dropped out of the youth group, dropped out of church, saw less and less of his family. And then suddenly he was home a lot and he stayed home. And it wasn't long before his parents knew why he was staying home more. Because one day, a police officer knocked on the door. This young man had witnessed a murder. One of the boys that he was hanging with, that group, they murdered another boy. Now, only one boy was guilty of the murder. Only one boy pulled the trigger. But this young man from our church, he was there. He didn't stop it. He saw it, and he went to prison because of it. Listen, you are what your friends make you. And our young people certainly need to hear that today. You are what your friends make you. Young people, your parents pour themselves into your life. You usually don't appreciate it. Sometimes you do. Later in life, I think you'll understand and be able to look back and see how your parents have poured into your life. They seek to pour in their knowledge, their wisdom, their goodness. Your grandparents are doing the same thing. Aunts and uncles, maybe some cousins, maybe some older siblings, Sunday school teachers, youth leaders, people from church. There are so many in your life seeking to pour good things into your life, but you see them less then you see your friends. Our friends have a tremendous impact in shaping and molding our character, whether we understand that or not. And I assume that like myself, all of us, regardless of age, were told by your parents, you are known by the company you keep. Again, I think that comes from Proverbs 18, one who has unreliable friends soon comes to ruin. Just put in a more folksy way, you are known by the company you keep. Now, 
if you know me at all, part of me wants to respond sarcastically to that kind of statement. I may be friends, good friends, with a man who is a philanderer. I may be friends, I may be good friends with a man who cheats at his work in order to make six figures. Now, that doesn't make me a philanderer or a cheat. And if people judge me on that because of who my friends are, well, they can just keep on walking because my friends are my friends. But when my parents said, you're known by the company you keep, they weren't trying to pass any judgment statements on my friends. They were partly wanting me to guard my reputation. Boy, that is a sermon in and of itself. They knew eventually, though, that my friends would influence my thinking and my behavior. Because they do, for all of us. It's one reason that I seek to be in the company of inspiring people. Why? Because then I'm inspired. That's why I like to be around inspiring people, people who are thinking, people who are always reading, people who are always observing what's going on in life and then have some great commentary about it. I learn from those people. And the converse of this is true as well. We help shape and mold our friends. It's important for all of us to surround ourselves with good friends, to be sure, to guard ourselves from poor influence. But listen, are we a good influence to others? We're proud to have friends. We love our friends. And whether our friends are Christian or not, are we modeling what it means as a friend to be a follower of Jesus? When I was in high school, my sisters were in college, and I remember I was probably a senior in high school. I had been very involved in our youth group and in our youth choir, which sang uh, every week during the school year at our church at the time. And I was going to various church leadership camps during the summer. But there was one person, let's call him Mike, I was hanging out with Mike. Mike was very popular at school. I wasn't so popular, but when I was with Mike, I was more popular. And so I liked hanging out with Mike. And my parents noticed that I was missing more choir rehearsals, and so I wasn't singing on Sunday, and I was missing more youth group opportunities. And so we went out to eat one night, and this is how my parents like to talk to me, to get me captive in the car. So we ate, and we get in the car on the way home. Dad took a couple of long cuts, took his time. And from the front seat, he said, John, we, we noticed that you've been spending more time with Mike lately. Yes, yes, I have. We know that you like Mike. Yeah, I, I do, actually. We've also noticed that you've been spending less time doing the things that you previously said were important. Being at church, taking an active role in youth, and the conversation continued, and it finally crescendoed with, you're going to discover in life, John, that you have to make some decisions, and sometimes those decisions aren't just difficult, they're painful. And you have to weigh out what is best for you, where you're spending your time, And you may need to make some decisions about your friendships. I knew what they were trying to communicate. And indeed, over the next months, it wasn't weeks, over the next months, I did see, I made a decision to see Mike less. Because I did realize that the prompting of my parents who were looking out for me, that I was straying away from those things that I said I believed, that I said was important. I was getting into some trouble that I wouldn't be getting into if I wasn't with Mike. And I did care deeply for him as a person. I had to make probably at the time was the most difficult decision I had ever made. It's a part of what we have to make these kinds of decisions as we're maturing as adults, but also as believers, as followers of Jesus. So 
as I begin to wind this down, let me just share a few thoughts about how we can offer friendship. It's not an exhaustive list in, in any means. Just some ideas. It's important, I believe, for us to be affirmative with our friends in our friendships. A young man put it succinctly, for me to have a good day, I've got to have at least 10 attaboys to every you're a jerk. And you probably do here, don't you, in life, the equivalent to you're a jerk? People hear it every day at their workspace. My wife has said for years that I don't live in the real world because I don't work in the real world. I work in an environment where people say, I love you, I'll pray for you, give you hugs. Working in the church, for the church, it's such a wonderful blessing, of course, and wonderful opportunity. But I hear people in our church talk about, well, the abuse maybe that they get from a boss, a fellow employee, a customer, not just the language, but the attitude. It's important for us to offer affirmation to a friend. And it's genuine, of course. That new hairdo you have looks fabulous. Hey, have I told you lately that I appreciate your friendship? Hey, when I rang the doorbell, when I was coming over, I heard you playing the piano. I didn't know you played so well. That was beautiful. You should play it in front of me more often. Let's give affirmation to our friends, genuine, sincere affirmation. It's important too, I think, that we offer intimacy. We can't be friends with a person and have barriers established, and I'm not going to share with you my innermost feelings and thoughts and desires. It's important for us to be real. It's important for us to be deep. I've been fascinated over the years, and maybe that's not the right word, intrigued when I read about celebrities who will die at a young age, often by their own hand, and we will learn at some point, not all the time, but sometimes we learn that they felt so alone. I wonder if some of them, from Elvis to Prince, began their drug abuse because they were so isolated from everyone. Or maybe they never could figure out if someone really liked them as an individual, as a real friend, or only because they were famous or had money. Did they not have good friends with whom they could be intimate? It's a desire, a need that we have in our very hearts. Let us share intimacy with our friends. Let us be genuine about our Christian faith and share it. And I'm assuming all of us have friends who are Christian and friends who are not. And it's important in both that we share our faith and not be reluctant to do so. In the 16th century, William Tyndale gave an arresting translation of Paul's phrase in Romans about providing hospitality to others. He put it this way. Be ye of harborous disposition. Now, that's a quaint, archaic expression, I suppose, but maybe because it is so unusual, you might remember it. A harborous disposition. We should have a harborous disposition. Frankly, I love it. To be a friend to another, I suggest this must be our disposition. Our lives are, be, are to be a harbor for others. We are not only to provide a physical presence and physical hospitality, but soul shelter, if you will. Share your faith, share your faith journey, the ups and downs of faith, your struggle perhaps at some time with belief or with scripture. Share scripture, offer to pray for your friend. It's important that we be genuine. It's important that we be real. It's important that we not compartmentalize what it means to be a follower of Jesus, that it's only about Sunday or it's only about singing contemporary songs or hymns or stating the affirmation of faith. It's something that affects us, changes us, and therefore it can affect and change a friend. Simply 
Be who you are in the faith because of faith. And finally, I'll say this, be positive, which is not the same as giving affirmation. And I know being positive doesn't necessarily sound Christian at all, but it's so important in this time in which we live, such negativity. It's dripping from everything we see and touch and hear. Some years ago, we moved to a new community, and I was moving into a community where in a neighboring community was a former friend, someone that I had known years previous, and my wife thought it was fabulous. Now the two of you will be able to have lunch occasionally. It'll be good for you. It'll be good for him. And I said, well, you know, the reason we kind of drifted in the first place is he's so stinking negative. He talks bad about the church he serves. He talks bad about the bishop. He talks bad about the district superintendent. He talks bad about everything, everything and everybody. And I just don't want to be around it. And my wife reminded me, well, that's one way to deal with it, to avoid it. The other way is to confront it gently. Why don't you make sure that you do have lunch? And then when he starts speaking negatively, again, in a genuine and real way, steer the conversation into a different direction. Remind him of what to be thankful for. Remind him of certain people's gifts. Remind him of his opportunities. Frankly, it sounded like a lot of work, but you don't tell Lisa Bowling no. So I didn't. Well, let me tell you, she was right. When we would meet for lunch and talk and he would veer into the negative, I would try to steer that into another direction of being positive. And it did change the tone of our conversations. And I can only hope it also changed the tone of his life, of his perspective, of how he saw things. Maybe that enriched him in some way. And then later enriched another person. When members of the Ugandan Children's Choir were in our annual conference about a decade ago, I had a conversation with one of the women who traveled with the children. And of course, we were talking about the differences between our our two nations, our continents, and how life is different. And as we were talking, she said, Americans are so wealthy And I found Americans to be rather genuine and generous, but also very busy. And so the new friends that I've met in America always want to give me stuff. She said, in Uganda, we're poor. And the only gift we have to give people is ourselves. And since I've been in America, I've missed the gift of other people. God help us, friends, friends. God help us. Let that not be said of me. Let that not be said of you. One of the greatest gifts that we've been given are the friends in our lives. And one of the greatest gifts we can give to another is our friendship in faith, of course. And so I will ask you, if you would, wherever you are, lying in your bed, sitting in a chair, maybe lying down on the couch, wherever, sit up, and the words that will be on the screen, join with me in a litany of thanksgiving, of gratitude, of affirmation, allowing ourselves to spill over into the lives of others as friends. Let us be about that this day and in this moment. God created humankind in his own image. In time and history, the word of God became flesh and lived among us. Thus, we have seen the glory of God. He taught us, no one has greater love than this, to lay down one's life for one's friends. You are my friends if you do what I command you. I do not call you servants any longer, but I have called you friends because I have made known to you everything that I have heard from the Father. You did not choose me, but I chose you, and I appointed you to go and bear fruit. I am giving you these commands 
so that you will love one another. Jesus' friendship destroys all barriers that divide people. As his representatives, we cross over barriers in order to become friends for his sake. As friends, children of God, we bask in his love as we live and serve him. In all our relationships and future relationships, we seek to share the love of Christ which he shares with us. Let us share the love of God and friendship of God with all we encounter.